Hey guys, in today's video, we're gonna be building this shaker inspired wall cabinet. This is gonna be out here in my shop and it's gonna be holding all of my PPE equipment as well as some camera gear. The cabinet is made out of solid cherry and the panel is a beautiful book matched curly figured panel. Uh, again, cherry, and it's finished with a traditional uh, shellac finish. It's a beautiful project that I've been needing in my shop for a while, so let's uh, get to building it. Simple Cove is proudly sponsored by Bits and Bits Company. Use Simple Cove 15 to save 15% off your next order. The cabinet is made using a few scrap boards that I had in the lumber rack. Since it didn't require but a few board feet, I opted to use cherry. Now the darker cherry board that you see in the middle is a nicely figured board that I've been saving for a couple of years now, and it's gonna be perfect for the book match door panels. Now we have to process the rough stock by first cutting all pieces close to their final length at the miter saw and then the width at the table saw. Next we flatten one face and get a square edge at the joiner before planing the pieces down to three quarters of an inch in thickness. So while building this project, I actually sold my bandsaw. So before the new owner picked it up, I needed to resaw the book matched door panels and let those sit and acclimate before needing them. All of the parts of the cabinets are milled to the final thickness. So next, I'll just need to cut them to their final widths and lengths at the table saw. The joinery for the cabinet are finger joints. Each finger is one and 19 30 seconds wide for a grand total of three fingers on the side panels and then two fingers on the top panel. To be able to see those lines while cutting the finger joints using the miter gauge, I extend those down about a couple of inches. And so you don't make the same mistakes I did, make sure to mark your waist so that you know what you're removing and what you're keeping. Next, I installed a dado stack and I set the height to the thickness of the board. The finger joints are cut, referencing a kerf in the MDF miter gauge fence. Next, I extend that line to the top of the fence to make it easier to line the marks up with the ones that I made on the side panels a couple of clips earlier. I use stop blocks to make the cuts repeatable, and you'll also notice how the lines that I drew earlier are up above the top of the fence, making it easier to see. It's pretty straightforward, just put it up against the stop block, remove the waste from the finger, flip the board over, and repeat the same action. Now to remove the waste, I clamp the board in place on one side using a trigger clamp, and then on the other side I'm just using my hand to hold it up against the stop block. It's also very important to note that the board needs to be seated flat against the top of your table saw. That way you're going to get consistent cuts. Just like when cutting dovetails, I like to put these little stickers on the corners just so that I know which piece goes with which piece, uh, so that when I'm laying out the other fingers, I'm actually gonna be referencing the board, as you can see here, that I just cut. And the little stickers are gonna make sure that I put these back in the right place. And now I'm just gonna remove the waste the same exact way that I did before, and you should have nice clean fingers. If you find that the fingers are too tight, you can remove a little bit of waste using the dado stack. And if for some reason you make them too small, it's really easy to fix. Just glue on a couple of shims and then cut those again until your fit is just perfect. Okay, now we're ready to lay out the through mortises on the side panels. The first thing that I did was mark the outside of the board just so that when I'm chiseling, um, I'm gonna start on the inside and finish on the outside just so we don't get any tear out. So to begin, look at the plans, um, but the mortises start at 12 and an eighth from the very top. And then I got a combination square that I'm gonna carry this line all the way to the edge and around to the other side. And next, the mortises are a half of an inch thick. So go down a half inch. And again, use the combination square to bring that all the way to the edge. And once you get this set up, you can use this one board to mark your other board so that way you're only having to do this once. And now with a marking gauge set to one in 19, 30 seconds, I'm gonna mark the edge of the mortise. And I'm just gonna rotate the board and do the same thing. And now before I change that marking gauge, I'm gonna carry this line around to the back side and mark 
the other side. Now we're going to switch the marking gauge to three and three sixteenths. Again, if you're off, what matters is that you're consistent on both sides. Now that we have the outer walls marked, we need to go ahead and inscribe the top and the bottom walls. So I'm going to put my marking knife in the edge that we just scribed and make a few light passes. One final thing we need to do is mark a center line of these mortises because I'm using a brad point bit. That way I can line that tip up with the center line and know that I'm going to be uh, drilling in the center of my mortise. So I'm gonna mark a quarter of an inch and then just bring that line all the way to the edge. Since I'm cutting half inch mortises, I've put in a 3 8 of an inch brad point bit to remove a majority of the waste, and that's gonna leave me about a 16th of an inch on both sides to chisel after I'm done drilling. All right, I'm gonna start chiseling out the waste, and I've got the board so that I'm gonna be chopping from the inside face, flipping it over, and finishing on the outside face. And I'm gonna start by removing the waste in the center and keeping the, the chisel nice and vertical perpendicular to the face. Again, just going down halfway, and then we'll flip it over and finish it. And then move to the scrub line. And this is the outside face, nice and crisp. Now to cut the tenons on the bottom shelf, or the bottom of the cabinet, whatever you want to call it, um, we're going to need to do a, uh, an eighth of an inch cheek on each side. So I've got the dado blade installed and raised to an eighth of an inch. And you're going to want to uh, measure for each of your side panels because we hand cut these so they could vary in the, uh, in the width or the thickness rather. So take a scrap piece, run it through, and get it to fit. And now to mark these, there's something that we need to do. And the first thing is we need to put a sticker on the side of the board so that when I cut these, I know that it matches the red side. And that way we also know which side faces out. So I'm gonna put a red sticker on the edge of the board and raise it up enough so that when we cut this out, it's not gonna be removed. Here's a tip for you that I didn't do. You need to use a longer auxiliary fence with a stop block to cut these shoulders so that you know they're in the same exact location. Now to transfer the lines, I've got the right angle clamping jig on the back and I'm gonna make sure that it's square. This board has a little cup in it, so I'm gonna make sure that the space on this side is the same it is as on this side. I can't mill this down and flatten it because it's already to, to thickness. So I'll just have to work around it, not that big of a deal. Make sure it's flush on the front and then just transfer your lines. And believe it or not, it's the same exact method to cut these tenons as it is to cut the finger joints. They're essentially the same thing. So I did a dry assembly of the case just to make sure that all the finger joints seat properly and that there's no gap or anything like that on this bottom shelf. So now the last operation that we're going to do utilizing the dado stack is to cut a groove on the back and that is a two inch wide, three quarter of an inch deep groove for the bottom stretcher. And this stretcher is gonna house probably three or four uh, shaker style pegs to hold stuff over when it's mounted on the wall. So I'm gonna disassemble the case and then lay out the grooves for those dados and then cut them the same exact way. To help make this a repeatable operation, I've actually clamped two stop blocks in place, one against the miter fence and the other one against the table saw fence. And I wanna mention that the table saw fence, that stop block will not be in the way when I'm making this cut. With the joinery cut, I can now cut the bottom stretcher to width and length. And then I'm just gonna use my joiner plane to clean up the edges and make the fit perfect. I've got this thing dry assembled partially just so that I can mark the faces for the groove that I'm going to cut at the router table. Now the groove is special in that it's inset three quarters of an inch before it even starts and that's because we're going to be gluing and screwing a French cleat to this. 
Now this top and the bottom panel, or vice versa, are gonna have this cut all the way through because we have these shoulders that are gonna be hidden by the side panel so it's not that big of a deal. Now these side panels are gonna have a stopped groove on one end. You can come all the way through the front or the top of this because remember, we're gonna be putting a, we're gonna be gluing another top on here. So if you have this hole, that's not gonna be an issue. It's gonna be covered. Now we're gonna have to do a stopped groove down on this end uh, that's gonna be a quarter inch past this, this shoulder. That way it lines up with that. So uh, mark your faces so you know when you go to the router table what you're cutting. And then also mark for your stopped groove on the midsection where the through mortises are. But on the top, you can go all the way through that. With the slots cut, I can now cut the quarter inch plywood to size for the back panel. To cut the curves in the sides, I've got a quarter inch plywood template. The plans come with a printable PDF file and I just use some spray adhesive to attach it temporarily to this plywood. And then I used my jigsaw to cut it out. I've recently just sold my bandsaw, so I'm using the jigsaw until I pick up a new one. But, uh, and then I use a spindle sander to take that down and make it a, a nice smooth curve. Before you transfer this, template onto your side pieces, you need to make sure of one thing. This is the bottom panel, and I've got this loosely fit on the, the case. You wanna make sure that your curve does not go up under or above the, uh, the bottom of this bottom panel. Even though we're gonna have doors that are gonna cover this, you don't want a curve to disappear underneath the doors. So what I've done is I put this panel back on there, and then I transferred a line to the side of the cabinet to let me know where the bottom of this edge ends. So that way when I'm placing this plywood template on the board, I'm not gonna go above that line. And if you have to move it down just a little bit, that's no big deal. You just don't want this thing to tuck under the doors. So I'm gonna move mine down. It's probably about a 16th of an inch off the bottom. This is handmade, so numbers are not always exact. Double check, and then I'm just gonna transfer it. I've got a flush trim bit over in the router table that's gonna give me an exact copy, but to remove a majority of the waste, I'm gonna use a jigsaw. The bit that I'm using is this Ultimate Combination Trim Bit. This is from Whiteside and it's Astra coated from Bits and Bits Company. And it does a fantastic job and it stays sharp a whole lot longer because it's Astra coated. And it cleans up really well. The bit stays nice and clean. Highly recommended. Before going up the case, I sand everything up to 220 grit and this is gonna prep me for pre-finishing the inside of the cabinet. Before we glue up the case, I'm going to apply two coats of a seal coat shellac on the inside of the case. And this is gonna help me in case I have any squeeze out, I can just pop it off with a, with a chisel. I'm not too concerned about squeeze out on the outside because I can always sand that away when this case is glued up. So again, I'm just gonna be applying two coats of full strength seal coat shellac. This is a D-Wax shellac. And I'm gonna be brushing it on using an ox hair brush. I've got these uh, critical areas taped over uh, just so I don't get any finish on them. And if I get any down in this groove, that's fine because we're not too concerned about that. We're not gonna be gluing that panel in. So it's been about a day since I applied the two coats of shellac on the inside. And the shellac has had enough time to set up that if I need to wipe anything away with some water, it's not gonna be that big of a deal. Oops. And so how I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna put glue on the fingers and I'm using liquid high glue. And that's going to lubricate the joints instead of causing them to swell like traditional uh, wood glue does. So I'm just going to put some glue on all the fingers and then put it together. And I'm sure you'll see that how simple it is to put that together. And while I have access, I'm just going to wipe away any squeeze out using a wet paper towel. And I'm not going to put any glue on the plywood bottom. It's just gonna be sitting in place. There we go. After tapping the side panel in place, I ended up putting about four clamps on the case and let it set overnight to dry. Now we can focus on the bottom stretcher, but before installing that stretcher, we're gonna mark and drill for four pegs. 
I felt that the shaker pegs were just a little too long um, for my comfort, so I ended up cutting off about an eighth of an inch and then drilling about a half of an inch deep. To mount the cabinet on the wall, I utilized French cleats. It's pretty simple to make. Just take a scrap board, tilt the blade to 45 degrees, and make a cut. You've got both pieces with one cut, essentially. Now you can see the off cut. I had to make that a little bit narrower, but both pieces are three inches in width. Now when it comes to the length for the piece that goes on the wall, I actually make that a little bit shorter so that I can slide the cabinet left and right. Now since we pre-finished the inside of the cabinet, I'm going to have to sand some of that away before applying the glue. Now I'm not only using glue to secure the French cleat to the case, I'm going to be installing four screws through the top into the French cleat. The main top of the cabinet receives a little edge treatment. I installed a 3 eighths of an inch roundover bit to put a roundover on the top and the bottom edge of the two ends and the front edge of the panel. This softens the look of the panel and makes it look a whole lot better. I applied glue to the bottom face of the top panel to attach it to the cabinet. And this is where I made a, a really dumb mistake. It's not really a mistake, but it's a poor choice of, I guess, applying the glue. Don't apply the glue to the top, apply it to the cabinet. That way, as you can see, I had to wipe away a bunch of glue. You don't really know where to not put glue, but if you put it on the top of the cabinet, you can put it all over the whole panel. But it's no big deal. I just wipe off a little excess after applying a few of these trigger clamps and F-style clamps. While milling the stock for the cabinet, that also included the stock for the doors. I cut the pieces to width, and then using my crosscut sled, I cut the rails and styles to length. Stop blocks are a must when cutting such critical components to size. The joinery method I chose for the doors are loose tenon joinery that I cut using the domino. But if you don't have a domino, a cheap self-centering doweling jig works perfectly. I make a center line for the domino, and then I route the mortises. To cut the grooves for the door panel, I install a quarter inch spiral bit in the router table, and then I set the fence back a quarter inch, raise the bit a quarter of an inch, and then I make the pass. The rails get a through groove, but the styles get a stopped groove. I use the same mark on the fence that I set earlier for the back panel of the cabinet. Before gluing the door up, this is the perfect opportunity to clean up the inside edges of the rails and the styles. I just use my number four smoother, a few passes, and they're ready for finish. Before installing the door panel, I like to put a couple coats of finish, and that's just in case the door shrinks during the seasonal changes. You don't see an unfinished portion of the panel. Since I'm using shellac for the finish, I just applied three or four full strength coats from the can just to darken it up a little bit. The glue up the doors couldn't be any easier. Since I'm using loose tenon joinery, I just put glue on the dominoes, insert those into the mortises, and clamp everything up. Since I'm doing a book matched panel on the door, I did want to make sure and double check that the panel is in the correct orientation just so that it flows perfectly from one door to the next. I'm using Euro style door hinges and to install them I made a mark 3 inches down from the top and then 3 inches up from the bottom of the bottom panel. To install the hinges I like using templates. The one in the video was purchased from Rockler and that was actually made for bloom hinges but it worked for these cheaper hinges as well. Next I place the doors on the cabinet and then I shim the top using 1 16th inch shims and then I transfer the marks. I use the Craig hinge jig on all of my cabinet door projects and it works great. I'm all for using jigs. With the holes drilled, I can install the hinges and then install the doors. And we can now apply the finish, but I first started by sanding everything, including the doors up to 220 grit. And I also used the 220 grit to lightly break the edges on the doors and I more aggressively broke the edges on the inside of the cabinet using that 220 grit. I brushed on the three coats and in between each coat I would lightly sand using the 400 grit sandpaper.
And the only thing left to do is to install the cabinet on the wall. And this is where you'll notice that I cut the French cleat on the wall a little bit shorter than the opening of the back. And this is gonna leave me some room to slide the cabinet a little bit to the left and the right to find the perfect position. Thanks for sticking around to watch the build. Um, I hope you picked up a thing or two. I'll have plans available for this. Again, it's gonna be keeping stuff like my camera gear clear of dust and my dust mask so that when I'm not out here in the shop, it's not just laying around collecting dust. And it gives me an awesome place to hold the rest of my gear, my hearing protection, eye protection, as well as my vest. So this is a, a project that I've been needing for a while. And uh, you know, why can't we get to find our things out here in the shop as well with this beautiful cherry? Um, it's gonna age really well. I'll probably update you a year from now, show you how it's uh, darkened and, and just turned even, even more beautiful. Eventually what I'm gonna do is end up turning some knobs um, and I'll probably make another video showing you how to do that. I'm not a very good turner, but I think I can probably knock out a couple of knobs for the cabinet. And I may go with a nice contrasting wood such as you know walnut or um, something, something dark most likely. But, uh, I'll have another video on that. Hope you guys enjoyed watching this one. If you did, uh, subscribe and hit the thumbs up and leave a comment. Let me know what you think, what you would change um, or what you think of the overall project. Again, I'll have links to the, to the plans on this one in the description below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next build video.